Well, welcome to our uh, Wednesday Bible study. Uh, saying hello to all the folks out there. Uh, let us start with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Almighty and gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for this day, for your blessings. And we, we thank you, Lord, that we have a personal relationship with you, and, and that we are not overcome by the things that are happening around us, Lord. But at the same time, we pray for, for guidance, for strength, and for uh, a clear path of what steps we ought to, we ought to take, Lord, as, as citizens, as Christians, Lord. Uh, remain with us, for those who are watching, that this study might be a blessing to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, uh, the books are right there under the coffee pot. Uh, you want another one? Huh? You want another one? Do you want? Yeah, give me some books from under the coffee pot. Anyway, uh, today uh, we, we want to start our, our study on mere Christianity. And there's a couple of things that we need to uh, address from the very beginning. And they... Uh, and they... Uh, and some of them have... Uh, C.S. Lewis says says so himself. Actually, he is saying this himself. And uh, and so, uh, first thing we want to say is that the, this is not an academic book. Why don't you sit next to the pastor? I don't want to be... Nobody, nobody can see you, don't worry. First thing we want to say is that it is not an academic book. It is not a, a book on theology, on doctrine, on philosophy, apologetics. Uh, how do you, how, how did this book get started? Remember? Yeah, it was a radio address. Absolutely. The BBC <coughs> invites C.S. Lewis to just have fireside chats, you know, on the radio, basically. And uh, and that's where that's how mere Christianity comes together. I think there's two or three different uh, writings that come together. But but yeah, so this is just uh, I, th I think it was a weekly show. I'm not I don't yeah. remember. Was it? I think it was. Yeah, during World War II in Britain, forty two and uh, forty three. One of the things that he says uh, is that he. One of the reasons that the BBC chose him is that he was not an academic. He's not a he's not a preacher. He's not a a theologian. He's just a regular guy. Well, a regular guy yeah. with a PhD from Oxford. But mm -hmm. there was a broadcast talks. Yes, called the Gag a Case for Christianity in forty two, or at six, forty three. Yes. 43. So. So uh, he's just a layman, he, and, and he, has, he is a guy that moved from atheism to Christianity in recent years. So that's one of the reasons they, they chose him. So the second thing we want to say is that <clears throat> he, he is a very, <clears throat> his style is, is just like that. It's very conversational, uh, no fancy words, you know. He, some of his uh, arguments are kind of hard to grasp, you know, because he, he says a lot, but but it's very, uh, it's kind of flowing, you know, it's very simple. He, he, you know, he has like two or three points at the most for each, each section. Um, so, that's one thing. So, the other thing we want to say is that we want to, we want to have a, a more of a conversation rather than than a line by line kind of uh, analysis, because the book doesn't lend itself to that really. It's more about uh, uh, a dialogue, and, and so he mentions several times in the book how people are writing him and saying, you know, well, you know, this is what I think about what you're saying. You know, so and people take up. And that's a, I think that's a, the spirit of our of our study this time around. Um, so, what was the other thing I was going to say? 
So let's let's jump right in, and uh, I think we ought to start at the preface this time around, just because it's our first lesson, our first lesson together. Um, and what do you remember? Is the if you read it, if not, it's okay. What is what is the main thrust of his book? What does he want to say? Remember. One of them is about the different denominations. Well, well, he he does mention that. Uh, the think of the think of the cover. Think of the title. Near Christianity, and near Christianity, near the word near does not mean. Uh, I mean, we think of near as what insignificant. Yeah. It's just yeah. whatever. <clears throat> but he's using it in the old. Classic sense, which means the pure, the absolute, uh, the nitty gritty, the the basic stuff. You know, basic is what I think. Of. Yeah, yeah. That's so near. He's saying near Christianity as as in just basic Christianity, and that is going to be the the essence of the whole book. And that's why we're going to talk about the denominations in just a minute. There is a a. Um, a dictum, a, a, a saying, a quote from this uh, this uh, bishop in uh, 434, his name was Vincent, and uh, he said that the church, at all possible, in the church, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which we have believed in all places, at all times, and by all people. What he's saying is uh, what we call Christian orthodoxy. Christian orthodoxy is the belief or the faith uh, believed in all places at all times by all people. That means that basic Christian orthodoxy or Christian orthodoxy is what the third century French believed and the South American 17th century and what people in Elgin believe, whether they're Presbyterian, Catholic, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, we all agree on that. That is mere Christianity. So, but he's not saying, he's not saying it in, you know, theological terms, you know, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know. He's not going about it that way. He, he's going about it in his own way. But that is what... So remember, basic Christian faith is the faith that is believed in all places, at all times, by all people. That's, uh, that's what, that's what uh, he's looking at. So therefore, uh, does he want to get into denominations? No, on the radio, he's talking to everybody. Yeah. It could be this denomination, this. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, so he, that's what he doesn't want to do. <laughs> and he's going to address it later, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, <clears throat> so, right. So, we're, we got that. In fact, on page uh, 9 of the preface, he has a word to say, actually it's a pretty long paragraph on uh, 9 and 10, about why he's not going to get into the whole thing about the Virgin Mary. Right? Because if you ask the Church of England, the Catholic Church, and the Pentecostals, well, you're going to get... <laughs> you're going to have fire, firecrackers, you know? Because we don't believe the same, right? So he's avoiding all that. The only thing I know, he says the very last line, is that the virgin son was God. That's all he says. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Another way of putting, uh, of putting it is in terms of basic Christian theology, or basic Christian doctrine or, or orthodox belief is what he calls on page 11 the HCF. We call it the what? 
the least common denominator, right? We call it the least common denominator. But he calls it on page 11, the highest common factor, which is the same thing. In other words, you want to, can you read that, uh, John, are you there on page 11? Yeah. Right here. <clears throat> the HCF turns, yeah. The HCF turns out to be something not only positive, but pungent, divided from all non-Christian beliefs by a chasm to which the worst divisions inside Christendom are not really comparable at all. Right there. What he's saying is, this Christian orthodoxy that I'm talking about, this, this, this core of basic beliefs is, is pungent. It's, what is he trying to say? It's, it's radical, man. Yeah. That's what he's saying. It's really radical. If we all agree on the same thing, it's a radical thing if you compare it to Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, the Moonies or Jehovah's Witnesses, or humanist. humanist, communist, atheist. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you compare it to in other religions of the world, it's going to be a, a big, what do you call it, a chasm? chasm. Yeah, there's a big chasm between us. You know, so our divisions among us, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists, they're really, they're really not that, that huge, right? But if you compare it to other, other faiths, now you're talking about something. What can you what can you say, John? Let's say uh, you you look into what Hinduism, Buddhism, or what? Buddhism, Buddhism. What are some things about Buddhism that just wouldn't or that they just clash with? Oh, just the, uh, the basics of, of reincarnation that you could be a, you know a bug or you could be a human and then if you your karma you know if you, what you've done is and it's Right, you might end up coming back as a dog or something, and you have multiple lives until you reach nirvana, until you get so high in your spiritual travel that you're no longer, you know. And it doesn't, it does talk about that life is pain and suffering, no matter yeah. what form of life, no matter whether you're human or anything. In order to get away from that cycle of life and pain and suffering, you have to be completely spiritual, and then you don't have a body mm -hmm. anymore. Enlightenment. So the incarnation just, you know, it just doesn't. We go to heaven and they come back down to earth as something else. Yeah. Time and time again. And yeah. until, what do they call it? Until the end of eons. And in, uh, like an eon is how long it would take to take, to wear down the highest mountain, one life at a time, every thousand years with the softest cloth there is. In other words, it's... <laughs> I mean, that is saying that, you know, that's a long time. Yeah. There's no, it's immeasurable, kind of like God's forever well there. So everybody gets there, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, there's a bunch of different ideas in Buddhism as well. So, so yeah, so that's exactly, that's exactly what he's saying, that, you know, the no. Trinity, the Incarnation, mm -hmm. the death on the cross, right. the resurrection, salvation. Uh, I just heard uh, Sam was telling me about uh, this uh, commentator, this guy, Ben Shapiro, who's an Orthodox Jew, and he says that there is no sin. What? He's an Orthodox Jew, but he says there's no, there's no sin. So there's no need for atonement. So the, the word Jesus, you know, so you see what I'm saying? That's that's yeah. kind of what uh, C.S. Lewis is saying. Okay, well, yeah, I'll say. <laughs> All right. Um, and then he has a story about you know, a lot of stuff, and it just goes on and on. Okay, another another part of the of the introduction is on page 15 of the preface. Uh, down at the second paragraph, talking about this mere Christianity, um, and there, beginning on the fourth, the end of the fourth line, it is more like a hall. See that? Mm -hmm. You want to read that, Jan? Okay. It is more like a hall out of which doors open in the several rooms. 
If I can bring anyone into that hall, I shall have done what I attempted. But it is in the rooms, not in the hall, that there are fires and chairs and meals. The hall is a place to wait in, a place from which to try the various doors, not a place to live in. Okay, good. So what he's saying is that mere Christianity, basic Christian belief, is kind of like the meeting hall. And so around the meeting hall, there's doors. So you got the Congregationalist, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, <laughs> and everybody else, African. And so we all are mingling here, but you really can't, it seems like you really can't express your faith there. You understand? You kind of have to add, that seems to, you, to me what he's saying, you kind of have to add some definition, you know, uh, and so you start looking for a room, right? Um, did y'all discuss about that at all? The room, the hall? But in order to in order to know what to do, and this is how he ends the preface, he turns to page 16. Uh, why don't you start reading there, Chuck, where it says uh, on the fifth line, and above all. Mm -hmm. Your book isn't the same as mine. No, I haven't had And above all, you must be asking which door is the true one, not which pleases you best by its paint and paneling. In plain language, the question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are these doctrines true? Is there holiness here? Does my conscience move me towards this? Is my reluctance to knock on this door due to my pride? my mere taste or my personal dislike of this particular doorkeeper. Okay, right. So so as you're trying to make a decision, you know, he says, if you, let's, let's turn it around, let's say, if you don't want to be a Catholic, why don't you want to be a Catholic? If you don't want to be a Baptist, analyze, ask yourself why, examine yourself, you know, is it just because you know, they're saints, you know, or because they have candles, or because they have rock and roll. You know, what is the real reason? You know, um, but I think that the first one is is, is what I, I like. That he says, "Are the doctrines true?" You know, is there holiness? Uh, and uh, is do you think that uh, when people choose churches today, are they guided by? You know, truth and holiness and <laughs> why do you laugh? And what what feels good? Do they like the music or yeah. their friends go there? Yeah. Or, yeah. You know. It's convenient. It's the closest one to where you live. Or the music or something. Mm -hmm. Something they like. The food feels the building. <laughs> the building feels yeah. also. Right, I mean some people won't go because they only have a uh, an auditorium type, and others uh, won't come here because we have just a, it looks like a church. <laughs> you know, there's an organ there. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I think that I think that's the culture we live in, though. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Goodness, I mean, we could talk about how technology has affected it. So no, and, and C.S. Lewis is saying, look, you know, uh, is it true? Mm -hmm. Is God there? You know, many times people come to our church uh, and visit, and they leave their their address, and and I always write them. Uh, and one thing that I say, 
I invite them back, but I also say, follow the leading of God. Let God lead you to where you can go and thrive and, and grow. You know? But we invite you back, you know, come back and, and we're, we're receiving one person this Sunday, by the way. One of the things with family, oh, you're here at Thursday service. Yeah, this uh, some of that, that row of uh, the new family that was there, yeah. Fran, and his name is Fran. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And her husband and the children. And, yeah. Yeah. But Fran, she's just, she's being received. She's yeah. just, okay, well, that's the preface. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to skip the forward by uh, Miss uh, Kathleen Norris. I don't even know who she is. And we get right down to the nitty gritty, man, <laughs> right away. <laughs> and why don't we, instead of <clears throat> starting on page three, why don't we start on page four? <clears throat> Here you go, man. I don't have something for my. <laughs> yeah, let's. Why, why don't we start? On uh, page four, at the top of the page, halfway down, it starts by, um, I mean, it says, it looks like, see, see there? So think of two people arguing. That's the scenario. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties were, were, were quarreling, had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality. I'll skip down three, three lines. Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong. And there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and he had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are. You got that? So, so what he's saying is, People are always complaining and arguing and, and pointing out things in different, different scenarios because there seems to be a, a sense of right and wrong. That's what he's saying, right? Do you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Keep going there, John. Now, this law or rule? Now, this law or rule about right or wrong used to be called the law of nature. Nowadays, when we talk of the laws of nature, we usually mean things like gravity, gravitation or heredity or the laws of chemistry. But when the older thinkers call but what when the older thinkers call the law of right and wrong, the law of nature, they really meant the law of human nature. The idea was that just as all bodies are governed by the law of gravitation and organisms by biological laws. So the creature called man also had his law. But this great difference that a body could not choose whether it obeyed the law of gravitation or not, but a man could choose either to obey the law of human nature or to disobey it. Right, but that's going to be one of his main points uh, mm-hmm. in the next couple of pages. That uh, the law, the law of human nature is different from the cosmic laws because you don't have to obey. You don't have to agree with it, right? So, um, let's see, let's keep going here. Yeah, back on uh, page five, uh, towards the bottom of the first paragraph, it says, um, he cannot disobey those laws which he shares with other things like gravity. But the law which is peculiar to his human nature, the law he does not share with animals or vegetables or or inorganic things, is the one that he can disobey if he chooses. So, in a subtle kind of way, uh, C.S. Lewis is already talking about free will. So he is talking about the law of morality, you know, this, this law of human nature, this sense of right and wrong, but he's also talking about free will. 
Uh, because the law of gravity, he says, we can, we can fly around for a while, but right? When the gas gets up. <laughs> but you know we can't fly. You know we can't. We're not fish and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so we're subject to that. But this other law, we're not. We are not subject to it. We know it, but we're not subject to it. And then uh, on the next paragraph, uh, it says, "This law." was called the law of nature because people thought that everyone knew it by nature and did not need to be taught it. A little, a little further down. By taking the race as a whole, they thought that the human idea of decent behavior was obvious to everyone. And I believe they were right. And of course he's talking pre-Darwin pre and pre-some right, of these modern uh, <clears throat> thinkers mm -hmm. I believe they were right if they were not then all the things we said about the war were nonsense Here, and, and notice what he says what was the sense in saying the enemy were in the wrong unless right is a real thing which the Nazis at bottom knew as well as we did and ought to have practiced if there is no sense of right and wrong, this, this law of nature or human nature or moral law, then how can we make a judgment about what the Nazis did? Right? And it's a very, very interesting thing because I, uh, I was reading a book, I read a book on, on the, Nazis, uh, the Nazis' participation in the concentration camp. You know, those, some of those guys shot themselves they were drunk every night. They would go crazy. Uh, they'd go sick. They couldn't sleep. Because just killing and killing is not... It, it just goes against human nature. That's right. You know? It just, and so, as much as, they, as much as they thought they were right in the Jewish... The Jewish... Solution? I think it was called the Jewish Solution. Right? Yeah. As much as they thought they were right, it went contrary to their nature, you know. And uh, and to me, that's very telling. You know? Can you think of another instance where? People who think they're right, just you know, something is just not doesn't settle right. Here's another example. Besides the Nazis. Most of it is a tribe or an ethnic group, one against another. As you've had everything from Plains Indians in the U.S. fighting each other to Africans you know, different tribes mm -hmm. they grow up hating each other and it's what they're taught yeah. and it's interesting pretty much a lot of the a lot of America, when the Italians came in, you know, they were considered by the people who lived here, the Americans who lived here, you know, they were lower class. The Irish were lower class. It seems like each, every 50, 100 years, when, when there's more immigrants coming in here, whatever the, the big group is, are pushed down, thought of less than, than us. So then, in about 50 years, uh, what's a group, what's a future group that will be coming in? 
and even, well, generationally. You had the beatniks and the hippies and the, you know, the, you know where we, one, the older generation didn't understand and didn't think too much of the social interaction and the beliefs and all of the younger generation. Yeah, so in 50 years, the Mexicans will be able to look down on yeah, <laughs> another group that's coming in. <laughs> that's not funny. Right? They're not, it's not what, it's, we're all not all the China, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's not, let's not start there. Right? I'm not. I'm right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, with modern stuff like the, we see that in the Africa, you know, like even in, in Yugoslavia when they, when that broke up, oh, the, yeah. the Serbs and the Bosnians they went to mm -hmm. killing each other. So you should the communists left. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. the Hutus and, and the Tutus in Africa, they, mm -hmm. they just went right at it. And they're unleashed. They were like, wait. You know. yeah. In the next paragraph and stage of the, yeah. on page uh, five and six, yeah, he, he, he says, you know, there's some things that uh, people all across the civilizations, they just don't, they frown upon it. You know, like, mm -hmm. like selfishness, he says, you know. Yeah. Um, and you can look at the Hammurabi Code, you can look at the Mosaic Code, you can look at the Aztecs and, and the, the way they, you know, if you committed adultery, they killed you. you know, that sort of thing. If you, if you upset your parents, man, they, they poked, or they poked, uh, they poked the hands of the kids who were misbehaving with, uh, my gay needles, poke them, mm -hmm. and then they put uh, hot pepper, oh, chili yeah. peppers on them. <laughs> you know, I mean, but what I'm saying is, yeah. there's, it, it's, it's across the board. It's, it's universal mm -hmm. where, where some things are just looked down on, uh, frowned upon. And he says, you know, it, he says, whenever you find someone who does not believe in the real right and wrong, moral law, that's fine until until the moment that you break a promise to that person and and he complains and he says it's not fair, right? Yeah. yeah he says that right there at the bottom of six. Okay, let's uh, keep going there on page seven. At the top of uh, seven, it seems then, Elisa? Mm -hmm. It seems then we are forced to believe in a real right and wrong. People may be sometimes mistaken about them, just as people sometimes get their sums wrong, but they are not a matter. But they are not a matter of mere taste and opinion any more than the multiplication table. Now, if we are agreed about that, I go on to my next point, which is this: none of us are really keeping the law of nature. Okay, that's right there. So, in the first few pages, he has tried to establish that there is an unwritten but real law of right and wrong, right? So now the second point is, nobody keeps it. <laughs> so let's see, let's see what he says. Um, uh, in fact, he's gonna end uh, the, the paragraph, the page that way, the chapter. Go to page eight and keep reading there, Elisa. That is to say. Uh, that is to say, I do not succeed in keeping the law of nature very well. And the moment, and the moment anyone tells me I am not keeping it, there starts up in my mind a string of excuses as long as you're armed. The question at the moment is not whether they are good excuses. The point is that they are, are one more proof of how deeply, whether we like it or not, we believe in the law of nature. If we do not believe in decent behavior, why should we be so anxious to make excuses for not having behaved decently? The truth is, we believe in decency so much, we feel the rule of law pressing on us so that, oh, that we cannot bear to face the fact that we are breaking it. And consequently, we try to shift the responsibility. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the classic example is yeah. when God appears at the garden and says, uh, So, Adam, did you eat of the, of the fruit? And what does he do? She made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, so if we if we look at today's uh, 
society and culture. Um, do you think that this sense of morality, uh, the law of human nature, is it as as vibrant as it was a hundred years ago, fifty years ago? You know, the sense of, of right and wrong. It doesn't seem so. I think everybody has a sense of right and wrong, but your basis has to be the same as now. What do you mean? Well, if I'm a kid and I'm arguing with my sister, and I say, you can't do that, that's not fair. And she's going to say, yes, it is. It's fair because I got it that. Her basis and my basis are exactly the same. You know, because she thinks that's fair enough. That's right. So if we both think it's fair, but we're not agreeing, something's, something's not level, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, it doesn't matter who you talk to today, if somebody thinks something's fair and you don't, you aren't talking well, on the same level. It's kind of going back to the Christian Manifesto, because yeah. uh, remember we talked about the Constitution and how it was, it was uh, agreed upon based on the Christian moral values of the time. And so how in the in the next 200 years, uh, the, the Christian moral foundation was kind of kind of moved off and the, the words of the Constitution kind of separated. And so now we have that situation where um, God-given rights are not quite the same anymore, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what you're saying. So we don't we don't have that. Um, yeah, where else do you see that that it's kind of it's not as it's not as clear. What between right and wrong? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, just the whole modern culture is written anything goes. Whether you think it's right or wrong, it's okay. It must feel good when it's okay to do this or that, and it's acceptable. By some, by, I don't know, it could be the majority of the people or not. You know. And part of one of the problems I find is if they, if you disagree with them, then they, they, they move to the point where they, you have to accept what they're doing and how they're, yeah. how they're acting. Because you just, you know, that's their uh, end game is yes, it's okay, go ahead and do that. It and also then depends. We have a sense of right and wrong, that what they're doing is wrong. It also depends where you come into the picture. When 9 11 happened, we were horrified. And our son said to us and within a day or two, I never understood what it was like to be patriotic, which shocked me. Yeah. But my <laughs> sense of patriotism comes because I was born in the 50s. My father had been in World War II. My uncle had died there. You know. Right. What did he know? What did my son know if he wasn't born until 78? His comparison, right. his his frame of reference is different. That's what I'm talking about with his sisters yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Your frame of reference has got to be the same. And even when it is, you don't agree sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because your interpretation of the frame of reference, you know, everybody's got that individuality brought into it. But we all feel the law of nature because we know when you're doing something wrong. And like I say, you just want to blame somebody else or make excuses for it. Yeah. So obviously, you know, obviously C.S. Lewis is, he's not saying it because that's not his intent. You know, remember, his intent is to kind of get everybody in the hall. Yeah. Right? Let's, let's just all look at this. You know, then you can go on and you know, be a Methodist or whatever. But really what he's doing very, um, very, uh, uh, not sneaky, subtly, subtly. Mm -hmm. He's bringing us to the idea of um, God's moral law and uh, human, human sin, uh, absolute, absolute wretchedness, you know, the, the, all the corruption of, of humanity. Uh, because that's what it means that nobody, he says, what did he say, nobody, what? 
Yeah. None of us is really keeping the law of nature. The Apostle Paul said, no one does good. No, not one. Everyone is... Everybody's turning around with a flashlight. Is he running? Yeah, probably. Ronnie, stop turning around. <laughs> yeah, so Paul, the Apostle Paul is saying the exact same thing. You know, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone is condemned. So it's kind of the same thing, you know. But he doesn't want to say it in those terms, you know. He never mentions Paul, he never mentions Jesus or the Old Testament or nothing. Because, uh, in fact, he said it, um, he said it somewhere else that it used to be that when people talked about repentance and sin, C.S. Lewis said this, uh, talking about this book, everyone knew about that because people went to church all the time. He's, and he goes on to say, we cannot assume that anymore. So you have to go back to just uh, simple conversations about human nature, yeah. right and wrong. Good God. It's interesting because this was written during World War II, which had a lot of the world praying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so what he's saying, but yeah, what he's saying is that even then, from his perspective, people were not as as committed as as, as we may as we may think. But okay, let's let's uh let's jump the Okay, the pastor's wife has a call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah all right, then, then there's a, a two basic objections to his first, his first uh, talk on the sense of right and wrong. And the first one is on, on page one, on page nine, where it says, for example, some people wrote to me saying, isn't what you call the moral law simply our herd instinct? And hasn't it been developed just like all our other instincts? Now, I do not deny that we may have a herd instinct, but that is not what I mean by the moral law. So what do you understand by herd instinct? Just like a herd of animals? That people have a tendency yeah. to go along group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. as a group, you know, and a group think, group action. In a sense of belonging to a group. Yeah. Wanting to belong to a group. Wanting to belong to a group. Yeah, yeah the herd instinct, yeah. Then he goes down a couple of, of uh, lines down, he says, and of course, we sometimes do feel just that sort of desire to help another person. And no doubt, that desire is due to the herd instinct. But feeling a desire to help is quite different from feeling that you ought to help, whether you want to or not. So, yeah. Well, he and I say we don't always agree on something. But if okay. we together, yeah. We together, <laughs> we together feel threatened by you guys. Now we're going to band up together and we're going to help each other against that threat. Isn't that what he's talking about? That's, yeah, yeah, that's that too, I think. Yeah. You fight amongst becomes, yourself. Our herd but, becomes yeah. here. So it doesn't, so it's not really about principle in, the, in, the, in this case. Maybe. But now what he's saying, what he's adding to that is the difference between. I want to help, mm -hmm. or I don't want to help, and I should help, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Which is different. He says it's different. Yeah. These two and the third thing which tells you that you ought to follow the impulse to help and suppress the impulse to run away. Now, this thing that judges between two instincts and decides which should be encouraged cannot itself be either of them. So in other words, the tug of war you feel inside of doing what is, of doing something or not doing something, you know, that predicament is not the law itself. Yeah. 
So he's trying to distinguish between your impulses and just that yeah. moral law that, that and in fact he says it at the very, the very last line right there he says the moral law tells us the tune we have to play our instincts are merely the keys and so, so we keep going there uh, right there Chuck, which is another way of seeing Another way of seeing the moral law is not simply one of our instincts, is this. If two instincts are in conflict, and there are nothing in the creature's mind except those two instincts, obviously the stronger of the two must win. But at those moments when we're most conscious of the moral law, it usually seems to be telling us to side with the weaker of the two impulses. You probably want to be safe much more than you want to help the man who is drowning. But the moral law tells you to help him all the same. That's a very, to me, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. On page 10? Page 10, yeah. Uh, second paragraph? Yeah. So, um, it's very interesting that he points out that it's easier to take the easy way out than to do it morally right. That's what it seems like he's saying. That's what he's saying. Isn't it? Yeah. Can I jump in and help the guy drowning? And drown myself. Possibly. <laughs> well, possibly. Or go, go get help. Yeah, call 911. And, yeah. Maybe they'll get the help out. And so, but the problem is that um, there's a discrepancy. Right? There's mm -hmm. something, one of them is greater, stronger than the other one. And we usually tend to side with the weaker one, which is the easier one, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. Right? And which, which, of course, he's not saying it, but it's that propensity to sin in a way. You know, it's, it's yeah. easier to, it's always easier to say yes to sin. It's the easiest thing in the world. To say no to sin is that. A good example is firemen and police officers. Somebody yells fire, or you hear gunshots, what are we going to do? Head the opposite yeah. way. They're trained, their instinct is to head toward the problem. Right. That's a, that's a good example. Trained to be able to. Yeah, they, they, they have to make that decision to... Look at what it says, the very next line, it says, And surely it often tells us to try to make the right impulse stronger than it naturally is. Which is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 And the third step, and a third choice in that is, do I help them or do I not? And if I don't, will I be able to live with myself? That, that or and with God. You know. that you're getting down to moral law. Yeah, yeah you're exactly. exactly. You're exactly. <clears throat> and, you know, one thing that I see, um, I mean, you know, it's no secret to everybody, you know, what's in our culture. One, see is the, one, th one thing that I see is the ability for many people nowadays to, to do what's knowingly against human nature. And, as in Spanish we say, con la mano en la cintura means with We're hanging your hip, mm -hmm. like, yeah. no, it's not a problem to lie, to cheat, to steal, to twist, to, you know, abortion or whatever. It's without shame. Without shame, you know. Without shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To see your point. So, anyway, I gotta keep going here. Okay, here on page uh, 11, he's just trying to um, make a distinction between the instinct and the moral law. So if you look at um, where it's down at the bottom, where it says strictly speaking, about 10 from the bottom, strictly speaking, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Lori, that down? Strictly speaking, there are no such things as good and bad impulses. Think once again of a piano. It has not got two kinds of notes on it, the right note and the wrong, note, wrong one. Every single note is right at one time and wrong at another. The moral law is not any one instinct or set of instincts. It is something which makes a kind of tune, the tune we call goodness or right conduct, by directing the instincts. Yeah. Right. Which is what he had said, had said earlier. But then he, he ends up with, uh, I think that's wrong. That's wrong. Why don't you keep reading there, by the way? By the way, the point is of great practical consequence. The most dangerous thing you can do is to take any one impulse of your own nature and set it up as the thing you ought to follow at all costs. There is not one of them which will not make us into devils if we set it up as an absolute guide. You might think love of humanity in general was safe, but it is not. If you leave out justice, you will find yourself breaking agreements and taking evidence in trial for the sake of humanity and become in the end a cruel and treacherous man. Right. So so um, it has it has a consequence to give way or to give uh, precedence or elevate one of our instincts or some of our instincts. Yeah. Uh, beyond the moral law. I mean, it could be anything, right? Uh, but but it's, it's fueled by, by selfishness. It's not really about uh, the moral law, what's right and wrong. Okay. Someone else said that, you know, don't we get all this just by education? And so she, you know, he, he discusses that uh, there toward the middle where it says, uh, after the question mark, I fully agree that we learn the rule of decent behavior from parents and teachers and friends and books as we learn everything else. But some of the things we learn are mere conventions which might have different, have been different. We learn to keep on the, on the left of the road, but it might just as well have been the rule to keep to the right. And others of them, like mathematics, are real truths. The question is to which class the law of human nature belongs. So the two classes that he talks about is something that is learned, but it's not fixed, right? It's something that is learned, but it's not fixed. Then there's another one that is fixed, and it's real truth. It's real, like math. Or like math. Mm -hmm. And so which one does the law of human nature belong to? That is, that is the question, right? And so he goes on to say... Go ahead, brother. Yeah, just put there are two. Oh, there are yeah, two yeah. reasons for saying it belongs to the same class as mathematics. Mm -hmm. The first is, as I said in the first chapter, that though, though there are differences between the more ideas of one time or, or, or country and those of another, the differences are not really very great. Not nearly so great as most people imagine. If you'll jump to the top of 13, where it says the other reason. The other reason is this. When you think about these differences between the morality of one people and another, you think that the morality of one people is e e ever better or worse than that of another. Have any of, any of the changes been improvements? If not, then of course there can never be any moral progress. Progress means not just changing, but changing for the better. If, not, if no set of moral ideas were or truer or better than any other, there should be no sense of preferring civilized morality to savage morality or Christian morality to Nazi morality. Right. So we go, we go back, we come back yeah. to the same thing. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, there has to be a foundation from which we can judge. There seems like it seems that everybody agrees that you know this foundation on something moving forward, you know, for the better, right. humanity, and something that is just taking us down to savagery. Um, and so he just kind of leaves it there, you know, he doesn't tell us except, you know, it's this 
is so. <laughs> the question is to which one the law of nature belongs to, and that for us it's a, it's no question of it. You know, it's like the worldview we talk about. Yeah. You know, the worldview that there's a right, there is a God, and there is this, and then there's everything else. He goes on to say, we do believe. Is, for some of us, it's as, it's as certain as, you know, as true as mathematics. Yeah. He says, we do believe that some of the people who tried to change the moral ideas of their own age were what we call reformers or pioneers. The moment you say that one set of moral ideas can be better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. Which is what we were talking about. <clears throat> All of a sudden you have this, this sense of a, of a higher standard. But the standard that measures two things is something different from either. You are in fact comparing them both with some real morality, admitting that there is such a thing as a real right, independent of what people think, and that some people's ideas get nearer to the real right than others. I mean, <clears throat> but don't you think this is like, uh, I mean, if you're in the middle of World War II, you're being pounded by Nazi planes. Don't you think it's kind of like an overstatement? <laughs> you know, like, like you're telling them something that they already know. Right. It's like. We run on the radio and telling them, see, you can, you can understand what The, the very last thing he points out on page 14 at the bottom, and we're not going to read it, but he says that uh, at the middle of the bottom paragraph, he says, there's a difference. He says, I have met people who exaggerate the differences uh, between people's idea of decent behavior. Uh, because they do not, they have not distinguished between differences of morality and differences of belief about facts. And then he, they ask him, was putting witches to death, was that right or wrong? And he goes on to say, well, that's nonsense because there are no witches. I would have, I would, I would completely disagree with C.S. Lewis. Uh, not in the, not in the uh, logic, but in the fact. Because even the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, talks about witches and and uh, and uh, sorcerers and that sort of thing. And so, for him to say, you know, was it right or wrong? I said that's that's ridiculous because. There are no, there are no witches. Yeah. I would, I would really disagree with that man. There are people today believe in witchcraft. Yeah. yeah, I believe. I mean, I believe it exists for sure. But anyway, that's the only thing I disagree with. He calls them filthy quislings, whatever that means. Quislings. Quislings. Yeah, that's kind of a. That's a New England, New England term. Yeah, like a neat, <laughs> slimy, just, you know, slippery. Uh, there is a bottle. Yeah, we're going to stop because... So we'll just... Uh, maybe we should have skipped the breakfast. But. <laughs> We always start behind ourselves yeah. and try and get ahead of ourselves, besides ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll start on, on uh, chapter 3, and then we just keep on going, 4 through 4, 4, four through 6, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Or not.
Chris Lang is a person who betrays his or her own country by aiding and invading enemy, often serving later in the puppet government. Oh, like a traitor. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. Well, I hope it's, it's been a good uh, introduction to this, this book. It's, I think it's, it's, it's thought-provoking, and next time uh, you read ahead and if you can bring in ideas or things that you have seen on the, on the news or things you have read, uh, that would be, uh, that'd be helpful. So. What do we read for next time? Yeah, four, four through six. Four through six. Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, thank you, Lord, so much for this time together, and thank you for all of your people. And I pray, Lord, that our discussion would be helpful as we look at our own lives especially in, light, in the light of Christ and in the light of the Bible, that we might uh, continue to accept that there is a moral law that you have deposited in us, Lord. And make it clear to us as we go forward, Lord, in Christ's name, amen. 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 amen.